after the Radahite Jews of the Rhine Valley and Lyon along the Silk Road Trail, we have the Merchants of Venice. And by tracing the um, what we call Jewish peoples today, and this is by no means a personal attack on the individual, what I'm doing is I'm tracing the dragon and the Gog Magog armies and I am going back to the antiquity of Christianity because this is where it started and I am doing an in-depth research of my religion and the actual meaning of the peoples that the book of Revelation were referring to and so by tracing the Ijumean converts to Judaism, by tracing the um, Edomite um, power within this early Silk Road, this was before the Roman Empire existed, by tracing the, the Ijumean conversion to Judaism, and the merchants that Jesus spoke of by tracing the merchants through the Silk Road and then to the conversion of the genetic Turkic Ashkenazim, we can then see how the banking families were formed and moved into the trading cities of Europe. Our whole system is based on this. And there's not, you know, we need to be able to talk about this. And we have a worldview that this is the only way as humans we can live using these banking systems. And it's wrong. We have to get our heads out of this matrix, as people call it, because we're in Plato's cave. We're sitting there with this film on the wall thinking this is what life's about and all we need to do is have a light come on and realize that we don't have to do things this way we haven't always done things this way it started somewhere and it's just grown into this beast that we just most people of the world look at the beast in wonder and think who can come against the beast who can take who can challenge the beast because we can challenge the beast we don't want this system. We don't want their system of fiat money and usury. We don't want it anymore. And that doesn't mean, Klaus, that I want your great reset either because I won't be part of some communist feudal system where I own nothing because I won't be happy, believe me. The Jewish ghetto, the world's oldest, remains intact. The first settlement until the 14th century, Jews were allowed to come to Venice for money lending activities but were not allowed permanent resident permits. The first Jews were allowed to settle in Venice only in 1385 when the city was involved in war against neighbouring Chiagia and needed loans from Jewish money lenders. So these money lenders would have earned their money on the Silk Road and would have been in um, places like, would have been in France, in different places in Europe but racism persisted and in 1516 Venice ruling council confined all the Jews in a small getty or foundries. The gates were locked at night and restrictions were placed on Jewish economic activities. Jews were only allowed to operate pawn shops and lend money trade in textiles and practice medicine and I'm just betting that that's the average person the average Jew and not the rich money lenders so men wore yellow circle stitch on the left shoulder of their cloaks or jackets while women wore yellow scarf later on the men's circle became a yellow beret and still later a red one the first Jews to settle in the ghetto were the Central European Ashkenazim so as we know they are the Scythian converts they built two synagogues the Scola Grande Tedesca in 1528 and 29 and the Scola Canton in 1531 to 32. 
They are on top the top floors of the adjacent buildings above the Jewish Museum and from the outside are not easily distinguishable from the apartments around them. So next came the Levant Jews who practiced the Sephardic rites when they got their own neighborhood. An extension of the Venetian ghetto granted in 1541. They were wealthy enough to build a synagogue on the ground rather than in top floor apartments. So you also have the uh, mixed in with the poor Ashkenazim were the Italian Jews who migrated north to Venice. You know, Venice was the gateway to the Silk Road in Europe. I'm just going to play a video here from Joanna Lumley's Silk Road, just explaining how that worked. So won't you come with me on my Silk Road adventure, on a journey along a road that literally changed all our lives. Avanti Matteo, but not too fast. This extraordinary city, built in the sea by people fleeing their enemies, with sailing and trading in their blood, grew to have one of the richest and most powerful empires in history. I can remember coming to Venice for the first time when I was maybe in my late 20s or early 30s, and I couldn't think why I'd never been here before. It seems to me one of the most important places in the world to visit, because you can't get your head around it. It's in the sea. This is salt water we're driving on. It's absolutely astonishing. Venice became one of the richest and most influential cities in Europe, all because of the trade that came along the Silk Road. And it's the perfect place to start my adventure. All over the city, you see evidence of other influences coming in. It feels quite different from other Italian cities. And that's simply because it was one of the end destinations of the Silk Road. Everything came to Venice. It was reveling in everything new. It grabbed all the new ideas. A luxurious, shimmering fabric made thousands of miles away in China was one of the most valuable imports to Venice and was the money-making catalyst that gave the Silk Road its name. So that's a really great documentary to watch on the Silk Road and I recommend watching it as it shows um, the history of where the Silk Road went and a lot of architecture but also here it just shows how Venice was the end of the Silk Road or beginning whichever end you want to look at and how this ancient road of trade from the Middle East grew to incorporate Europe which in, in the time of its beginning was little more than villages here we have the Feast of Lots or the Feast of Purim and it, the Feast of Lots or Purim commemorates the salvation of the Jewish people through the heroism of Queen Esther in Persia. The name Purim or Lots was most likely given to the festival in a sense of irony because Haman, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted against them to completely destroy them by casting the lot. Today's Jews not only celebrate this great deliverance on Purim, but also the continued survival of the Jewish race. Today, Purim is celebrated on day 14 of the Hebrew month of Adar, February or March. So just remember that February or March, originally Purim was established as a two-day observance. The Purim festival is the festival of masks. Purim is different. While other Jewish holidays can be serious and solemn, Purim has fun games and evening clowning. For many generations, Purim has been considered the festival of masks. While there may, be, may have been outside influences, the masks seem to grow out of the very essence of the festival. The entire Book of Esther can be defined as a story of masks. The book begins with a wine drinking banquet. From that point on, the atmosphere of drinking feast continues to reign in all events and episodes of the story. 
And here we have the v Venice Masks, the deep bond of Venetian carnival mask history with tradition, theatre and entertainment. The Venetian carnival mask history is lost in the labyrinth of time. In a charming story in which real historical facts are blurred with a mix of tradition and folklore. So what is carnival mask? Since the beginning of the celebrations, carnival in Venice costume and a, in particular masks have been very soul of carnival a way to have fun and entertain in total enormity venice carnival mask meanings preserve numerous examples from famous venice carnival masquerades which accounted for one of the most singular moments of the whole carnival celebration to the close relationship between commedia dell'arte and carnival which started almost by accident and became one of the most interesting kinds of theatrical representations. So here it tells us the tradition of the mask started in the 13th century when Venetians would hold celebration at parties from December 26 until the start of Lent and wear elaborate masks to conceal their identity. These parties were the only time when the lower and upper classes mingled together. Aristocrats and peasants disguised by their masks played out their fantasies together. They indulge in illicit activities like gambling, clandestine affairs, political assassination, and dancing and partying the night away. So it started in the 13th century when these um, bankers were allowed into Venice to fund the war. So for 2022, the Venice Carnival date will run Saturday, the 12th of February to Tuesday the 1st of March and so this Venetian mask festival runs within the same time as the Feast of Purim showing a link between this Jewish feast and the city of Venice. The Carnival of Venice is an annual festival held in Venice, Italy. The carnival ends on Shrove Tuesday Mardi Gras, which is the day before the start of Lent on Ash Wednesday. So when is Lent? So it says masks have always been an important feature at the Venetian Carnival. Traditionally, people were allowed to wear them between the festival of Santo Stefano, St. Stephen's Day on December 26, and the end of the carnival season at midnight of a Shrove Tuesday, movable, but during February or March. And the connection with the 13th century start of the mass festival. The history of banking began with the first prototype banks, which were the merchants of the world. Um, many of history's positions, the crucial historical development of banking system to medieval and Renaissance Italy, and particularly the affluent cities of Florence, Vienna and Genoa, the Bardi and the Peruzzi families dominated banking in the 14th century Florence, establishing branches in many other parts of Europe. So we can see that there's something going on here in Venice that a link that's not being made. They're saying that this mask festival just is shrouded in mystery now and that they don't know of its origin. But, you know, if we link the dots together, we have the festival of Purim, which is a masked festival and it is celebrated during the time between February and March and we have the Venetian Mask Festival which is celebrated at exactly the same time and it can't just be a uh, coincidence that these two festivals have very similar themes and exactly the same dates for their celebrations and I have to conclude that these festivals are connected via the banking families who controlled these cities who came into this city through the Silk Road and I have to assume that these banking families were from these banking peoples of the Radha Heights and the Ashkenazim who were controlling the Silk Road banking and power.
Revelation through disguise is part of Purim's message. Harmon pretended to be a faithful advisor to the king and in that false role showed his true colours as a hater. Esther pretended to be a simple subject who loved the king and in that role was unveiled as a saviour of her people. Perhaps most hidden of all in the story is God, whose name is not mentioned in the scroll of Esther at all, but whose pretense is felt throughout the miraculous tale. It is a paradox to reveal oneself through disguise, but at times a bit of pretense liberates us through the express deeper truths. Purim provides the opportunity to dress up as others in order to more deeply discover who we are. So why include the book of Esther in the Bible when God was never mentioned in it? The book of Esther is one peculiar book. Even though the Bible is the word of God, Esther is the book in the Bible where God was never mentioned. So why did scholars have to include Esther as canon in the Bible? So the book is written a hundred years after the Babylonian exile. The Jews started living alongside the Persians who were reigning at the time. And even so, the Jewish community remained faithful in serving God, as was evident in their identification as God's people. Moreover, synagogues were still established as centers of hearing God's word. So ultimately, I'm not too sure about the book of Esther because it's a story of deception. And this is why they wear the masks. Also, the story is about a Jewish or he, um, yes, Jewish, because they're in Babylon after the Babylonian exile, so it's the southern kingdom. And she, it's about um, integrating with royal family. So this was the king of Persia that she married. And I'm just wondering if the importance of the story to these groups who have seemingly brought this festival to Venice is about their family and seeking privilege through rising to high places within royal courts and gaining favoritism to your cause via these aristocratic unions between Idumean, I guess, aristocracy uh, like the Herods did and intermarrying with the Roman aristocracy and the Parthian aristocracy. One of the most well-known heroines in the Jewish Bible is Queen Esther, who became the king of Persia's consort and thereby had the means to save her people from slaughter. The Jewish holiday of Purim, which typically falls sometime in March, tells Esther's story. In many ways, Esther's story, known as the Book of Esther in the Christian Old Testament and the Megillah scroll of Esther in the Jewish Bible, reads like a Cinderella tale. The story begins with the Persian ruler, Aesurus, a figure often associated with the Persian monarch known by his Greek name as Xerxes. The king was so proud of his beautiful queen Vashti that he ordered her to appear unveiled before the country's princes at the feast. Since appearing unveiled was the social equivalent of being physically naked, Vashti refused. The king was enraged and his counsellors urged him to make an example of Vashti so that other wives wouldn't become disobedient like the queen. Thus poor Vashti was executed for defending her modesty. Then Aesurus ordered the comely virgins of the land to be brought to court to undergo a year of preparation in the harem. Each woman was brought before the king for examination and returned to the harem to await his second summons. From this array of lovelies, the king chose Esther to be his next queen. What Aesaurus didn't know was that his next queen was actually a nice Jewish girl named Hadassah, Myrtle in Hebrew, who had been brought up by her uncle, Mordecai. Hadassah's guardian counseled her to hide her Jewish heritage from the royal husband. This proved fairly easy since upon her selection as the next queen, Hadassah's name was changed to Esther. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, some historians interpret the name Esther to be a deviation of the Persian word for star, denoting her ascendancy. 
Others suggest that Esther was derived from Ishtar, the mother goddess of Babylonian religion. Either way, Hadassah's makeover was complete, and as Esther, she wed King Ahasuerus. About this time, Ahasuerus appointed Haman to be the prime minister. There soon was bad blood between Haman and Mordecai, who cited religious reasons for refusing to bow down to Haman as custom demanded. Rather than going after Mordecai alone, the Prime Minister told the King that the Jews living in Persia were worthless scoundrels who deserved to be annihilated. Haman promised to give the King 10,000 silver pieces in exchange for a royal decree allowing him to slaughter not only Jewish men but women and children as well. Then Haman cast the Pur or Lot to determine the date of the slaughter and it fell upon the 13th day of the Jewish month of Adar. However, Mordecai found out Haman's plot and he tore his clothes and put ashes on his face in grief, as did the other Jews he'd alerted. When Queen Esther learned of her guardian's distress, she sent him clothes but he refused them. Then she sent one of her guardians to find out the trouble and Mordecai told the guard, everything of Harman's plot. Mordecai began Queen Esther to intercede with the king on behalf of her people, uttering some of the Bible's most famous words. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews, for if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. There was only one problem with Mordecai's request. By law, no one could come into the king's presence without his permission, even his wife. Esther and her Jewish compatriots fasted for three days in order for her to get up her courage. Then she put on all her best finery and approached the king without a summons. Ahasuerus extended his royal scepter to her, indicating that he accepted her visit. When the king asked Esther what she wanted, she said she came to invite Ahasuerus and Haman to feast. On the second day of banquets, Ahasuerus offered Esther anything she wanted, even half his kingdom. Instead, the queen begged for her life and all the Jews in Persia. Revealing to the king Haman's plot against them, especially Mordecai, Haman was executed in the same manner planned for Mordecai. With the king's agreement, the Jews rose up and slaughtered Haman's henchmen on the 13th day of Ada. The day originally planned for the Jews' annihilation and plundered their goods. Then they feasted for two days, the 14th and 15th of Ada, to celebrate their rescue. In their article on Esther in the Jewish Encyclopedia, scholars Emil G. Hirsch, John Dinelli, Prince and Solomon Schurchter state unequivocally that the biblical record of the book of Esther can't be considered historically accurate even though it is a thrilling tale of how Queen Esther of Persia saved the Jewish people from annihilation. For starters, the scholars say it's highly unlikely that Persian nobles would have permitted their king to elevate both a Jewish queen and a Jewish prime minister. The scholars cite other factors that tend to refute the book of Esther historically. The author never mentions God to whom Israel's deliverance is attributed in every other Old Testament book. Biblical historians say this omission supports a later origin for Esther, probably the Hellenistic period when Jewish religious observance had waned as shown in other biblical books from the same era such as Ecclesiastes and Daniel. The author couldn't have been writing during the height of the Persian Empire because exaggerated descriptions of the royal court and uncomplimentary tales of a king who mentioned by name. At least he couldn't have written such critical descriptions and lived to tell the tale. In an article for the Journal of Biblical Literature, the Book of Esther, an ancient storytelling scholar, Adele Berlin, also writes about scholarly concerns over Esther's historical accuracy. She outlines the work of several scholars in the distinguishing authentic history from fiction in biblical text. Berlin and other scholars concur that Esther is probably a, a historical novella that is a work of fiction that incorporates accurate historical settings and details. 
Like historical fiction today, the Book of Esther could have been written as an instructive romance, a way to encourage Jews facing oppression from Greeks and Romans. In fact, scholars Hirsch, Prince and Shisha go so far as to argue that the sole object of the Book of Esther was to provide some backstory for the Feast of Purim, whose antecedents are obscure because it corresponds to no recorded Babylonian or Hebrew festival. So according to many Bible scholars, the festival of Purim did not have its source in the story told in the book of Esther. According to Haim Shus, Purim originally appeared among the Persian Jews and was adopted by them from their non-Jewish neighbours. The Jews of Persia observed, along with their neighbours, an annual festival that was celebrated in the middle of the last of the winter months. From the beginning, it had characteristics of a spring masquerade and was a festival of merriment, play and pranks. A very popular festival with both Persians and the Babylonian Jewry. It eventually spread to Palestine. Theodore Gaster presents several theories for the origin of Purim in his volume Festivals of the Jewish Year. In one theory, Purim is asserted to date back to Babylonian New Year festival. On this day, the gods were believed to determine the fate of men by lot, and the Babylonian word for lot was Puru. It was also postulated that the festival the festival was characterized by a ritual pantomime that portrayed the conquest of Babylonian gods over those of its neighbors. The problem with this theory is that the Babylonian New Year festival fell in Nisan, April and not in Ada, March, and it lasted a full 10 or 11 days. So another theory starts from the fact that both the ancient Greek version of the Bible the Septuagint and the historian Josephus called the festival not Purim but Ferdeia, which is contended to be a distortion of the old Persian Farwadigan, a feast held towards the end of the month of March. The fact is, however, that the feast of Farwadigan lasted at least five days and was primarily a commemoration of the dead. A third theory connects the name Purim with Hebrew word Purah, wine press, and assumes that the festival arose in the Greek period as an adaption of the Greek festival of Pithoigia, or opening the wine casks. Again, this theory has its problems. Opening of wine casks occurs in the fall rather than the spring, and the plural of the word Pura is Purot, not Purim. Gaster concludes that the story of Esther is not a historical fact and that the reason for associating it with the Feast of Purim could have been that the details for the feast were conveniently explained. He points out that the original form of the feast had these components, the selection of a new queen corresponding to the selection of Esther, the parade of a commoner called king corresponding to the parade of Mordecai in the streets of Shushan, a fast corresponding to Esther's fast, the execution of the felon corresponding to the hanging of Haman, and the distribution of gifts. Furthermore, that festival must have taken place around the time of the vernal equinox, for it is then that Purim occurs. All of these aforementioned conditions are satisfied if one assumes that the festival of Purim dates back to an earlier pagan New Year festival. Indeed, at New Year, it is customary in many parts of the world to appoint a new ruler in order to symbolise the renewal of communal life. Likewise, the installation of a commoner as a temporary ruler between the end of the year and the commencement of another while uh, was quite commonplace. The Babylonian New Year was also known to feature a type of scapegoat ritual whereby a condemned criminal was led through the streets in a processional. Finally, there indeed was a custom of distributing gifts and the new year, as there is today on Purim. Some scholars have suggested that the Scroll of Esther was written long after the Persian period and was a kind of historical novel intended to comment on the situation of the Jews under 
Hellenistic rule. In any event, whatever the true history of festival of Purim, it had long become established by the second century of the Common Era when the whole tractate of the Talmud called the Megillah Scroll was devoted to the details of the observance. So there we have it. It seems that the Feast of Purim is a Babylonian captivity Persian slash Judaic festival based on paganism and that the Book of Esther wasn't written in the time of this captivity but later on in a Hellenistic period. Uh, so therefore I don't think it should be included with the Bible. Also the Feast of Purim is, uh, it says here, was the Talmudic devotion to the observance of the Feast of Purim. And that just um, ties into my theory even more that the the masked feast of Venice was brought to that city by the Talmudic observing Jews and banking merchants who had taken over through their wealth and through their power. So how were the books of the Bible chosen? The 39 books of the Old Testament form the Bible of Judaism, while the Christian Bible includes those books and also the 27 books of the New Testament. This list of books included in the Bible is known as the Canon. That is, the Canon refers to the books regarded as inspired by God and authority for faith and life. No church created the Canon. The churches and councils gradually accepted the list of books recognized by believers everywhere as inspired. So the, the churches gradually accepted the list of books. It was actually not until 367 AD that the church father Athanasius first provided the complete list of the 66 books belonging to the canon. And I wonder why they chose the number 66. He distinguished those from other books that were widely circulated and he noted that those 66 books were the ones and the only ones universally accepted. The point is that the formation of the canon did not come all at once like a thunderbolt but was the product of centuries of reflection. Let's look first at the Old Testament. Obviously the first five books, sometimes called the Torah or the Pentateuch, were the first to be accepted as canonical. We're not sure when this occurred but it was probably during the 5th century before Christ. Of course the Hebrews had law, the law for many centuries already but they certainly did not pay very good attention to it. It was probably the work of the prophets Ezra and Nehemiah that restored it to general use and fixed it once and for all as authoritative. How about the rest of the Old Testament? The prophets writings were also not brought together in a single form until about 200 BC. The remaining Old Testament books were adopted as canonical even later. The Old Testament list was probably not finally fixed much before the birth of Christ. The Jewish people were widely scattered by this time and they really needed to know which books were authoritative word of God because so many other writings claiming divine authority were floating around. With the fixing of the canon they became a people of one book and this book kept them together. Nor is there a single date when we can say that the canon of the New Testament was decided. In the first and second centuries after Christ, many, many writings and epistles were circulating among the Christians. Some of the churches were using books and letters in their services that were definitely spurious. Gradually, the need to have definite lists of inspired scriptures became apparent. Heretical movements were rising, each one choosing its own selected scriptures, including such documents as the Gospel of Thomas, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Apocalypse of Peter and the Epistle of Barnabas. Gradually it became clear which works were truly genuine and which mixed truth with fantasy. By the end of the 4th century the canon was definitively settled and accepted. In this process Christians recognised the providence of God in providing us with his written revelation or of himself and his purpose with the universe. These questions still arise now and then about the canon. Some wonder why these 66 booklets were chosen. Why not 65 or 67? Why was 
the sometime puzzling booklet of Jude included to the exclusion of other edifying scriptures. To these questions we reply that these books are the ones that God himself has chosen to preserve for us and he has not told us exactly why. Together they form an immeasurable treasure and in them we find God's matchless gift to his people. Here we are moved simply to trust his providence as he led his people through the years. Okay, so, you know, some other books have been preserved too. They're just not included in canon. So I guess it's our choice if we want to decide that they are inspired, you know, like the Book of Jubilees and different different non-canonical books. Um, but that being said, like these people who were part of the Council of Nicaea, um, who were these people and why did they choose these books? And even going back to the Old Testament, you know, 200 years before Christ, um, we already realized that the Hebrew people or the tribe or the southern kingdom of Judah were using the Babylonian Talmud. Um, and so if they were trusting that book, how do we know that the books of the Bible are the right ones um, and I guess to say that we can't except to know that does that book speak truth you know like I've read the other so-called religious books of different faiths that one written by say for example Joseph Smith and none of it makes sense to me I don't enjoy reading it um, so to me, whatever book brings you closer to spiritual understanding and truth. First Corinthians thirteen twelve. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And I think that what we do have available to us is cryptic and I think that it's been left by God for us to decipher and we do see in a mirror dimly we don't see the whole big picture um, but it's enough there's enough in what we do have to make sure that we're on the right path and that we are led back to the truth okay so according to this website about the carnival in venice it says here in the in a document by doug vitali Fil, faliero de doni referring to the entertainment for the public the word carnival is mentioned for the first time and this was in 1094 1162 beginning of celebrations for the carnival of venice in saint mark's square so this is saying that the carnival goes back much earlier than other sources say which was about the 1300s 1268 prohibition of throwing perfumed eggs in st mark's square and it seems that there's a tradition with the carnival in venice is to throw perfumed eggs and the idea of the eggs around this time of year and with purim the story of esther or Ishtar, as some people believe she is based on, is the is the association with eggs and Easter and Easter Esther Ishtar. Another interesting thing to point out is the heraldry for Venice, which is a lion with wings and a book. So here we have a flag, a yellow lion with wings and a book. So this reminds me of uh, Daniel's Babylonian lion. It's a lion with eagle's wings and the eagle's wings get plucked off. And I'm just wondering what the Latin says on the book. So I'll just read this about the line of Venice and this story seems a bit bogus to me because it's saying that the line is um, a symbol of St. Mark and I don't know what a winged line has to do with the Apostle Mark at all. But anyway, 
When visiting Venice, it is hard not to notice the many lions adorning the doors and facades of the buildings, especially around St. Mark's Square. Let's take a closer look at the symbol of Venice to discover some of these lesser known aspects of the history of Serenissima. Uh, St. Mark's Lion. The Venetian lion normally has wings, very often holds a book below its paw, and sometimes it co is completed by a halo around its head. These three elements, wings, book, halo, reveal it as a symbol of St. Mark the Evangelist, patron of patron saint of the city. Um, how that is, I do not know. According to the tradition started in the 2nd century AD, each of the four evangelists is represented by winged creatures, lion, bull, eagle, human. This set of four creatures was also used in relation with the divine presence in the Old Testament. Also, the lion has been associated with power, courage, strength since ancient times, or better symbols for the prestigious Venetian Republic. Pax Tibi Marseille. So now we know that the book the lion is holding stands for the gospel of Saint Mark. So it says Pax Tibi Marseille Evangelista Mias, which translates as Peace to you, Mark, my evangelist. According to legend, while Saint Mark was visiting the Venetian lagoon in the first century AD, a storm put him in danger, but an angel appeared to him and reassured the saint with whose words sometimes a different phrase is written in the book. For example, the painting of the line displayed in the government offices contained credos specific to the work of the magistrate there. So this one at the Rialto market says, Rialto no si to toca. Don't touch the Rialto market. So yeah, to me, I mean, if I was to look at the symbolism of the lion with the book, it's the lion of Babylon with the eagle's wings and possibly the book represents the Babylonian Talmud. I'm not sure. But it certainly wouldn't stand out to me as the Apostle Mark. Revelation 4 verse 6 to 9. Um, and before the throne there was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne on each side the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The living creatures, the, li the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like the face of a man and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So the lion creature that they refer to has six wings, not two. The line of Daniel 7, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And if we see this Babylonian line, this line of Venice looks more like this. And later on in the European heraldry, a lot of the heraldry has lines standing like a man. And here we have the line in European monarchies coat of arms and this is the Netherlands has got standing lines United Kingdom standing line the Prince of Wales a standing line Norway Denmark these ones aren't standing Sweden standing lines this one's a red standing line Sweden And according to somebody's answer here, European monarchies are extremely intertwined. All European dynasties are related to each other. It's not surprising that they use the very similar symbols. For example, take a look at the family tree of the German monarchies. So they all come from Charlemagne, Carolingian, Louis II of the German, Louis II the German. All these royal families that seem like individual families that arose to power on their own have all all branches of the same family basically 
Habsburgs, Lorraine, Luxembourg, and they've joined, Habsburg, Lorraine joined, Napoleon Bonaparte. In Ezekiel 8, it says, And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall around about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Saphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said unto me, Turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Jeremiah 7, verse 16. Therefore do not pray for these people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Do not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. The children gather wood, fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the Queen of Heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? So this Feast of Purim and... Es, the book of Esther, they make these hamantashen sweet cakes. It's the same time as the Ishtar Persian festivals. Um, so I just can't help but see the similarities in this story and in this book. And I, I um, going on the historical information, I don't think this book is inspired so we have ishtar worship as the queen of heaven and people baking cakes to her and we have esther who is being portrayed as the virgin queen and this feast has been made up to disguise the Ishtar worship. Interesting, one of the characters of the masks that they use in the Venice festival is the Jewish mask or Jews mask. It says, hard to resist in a foul situation like Carnival, not to tease this community of which Venetians were really so fond of. Hence the mask with the long nose, shabby clothes and ever-present Bible in their hand. Presence of Jews in the territory of the Venice Republic is acknowledged since the year 945 AD. So this is a much earlier date than the 13, 1400s that they said they came back to Venice. Jews' occupation was mainly in lending money for an interest and other similar activities, which were forbidden to Christians by the Church of Rome. So the Jews' presence was highly justified in a city that was doing commerce with half the known world and with lots of money rolling around. So it's funny that the Church of Rome have so much power to tell Christians they can't charge interest, and I'm not promoting the idea of charging interest or usury for people, but it was okay for these people to come in and do it to Christians. And like I said earlier in another video, it seems that almost the church allowed this to happen. Uh, because this gave these group of money changers great power over Christian people. The Corno Ducale, so it's called in Italian the Ducal Horn, a unique Ducal hat, was the headgear and symbol of the Dogue of Venice. It was a stiff horn like bonnet, which was made of gemmed brocade or cloth of gold woven 
over a Camaro. The Ducal horn was a fine linen cap with a structured peak at the back, reminiscent of the Phrygian cap, a classical symbol of liberty. So this is definitely uh, resembling a Phrygian cap. Says the origin of the design is uncertain. Venice was heavily influenced by the Orient, though through trade and cultural exchange. This ceremonial headdress shares similarities with the Phrygian cap or the white crown of the Upper Egypt. When Venice was still part of the East, uh, Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire, high-ranking Byzantine soldiers station, stationed in Venice also wore a headdress reminiscent of the horned Phrygian cap. The first record mentioned of the corno is from the 12th century, although it is possible that the dogs already wore similar hats before then. Phrygian cap um, is a really interesting shaped cap because it was used in the French revolutions for a purpose. So in early Hellenistic world, it was used by the 4th century BC, early Hellenistic period, the Phrygian cap was associated with Phrygian Attis, uh, were an ancient Indo-European speaking people who inhabited central western Anatolia in the antiquity. They were related to the Greeks. So according to Babylonian records starting around 615 BCE, the Scythians were operating as allies of Syraxeres the, and the Medes in their war against Assyria and were finally expelled from southwest Asia by the Medes in 590s BCE, which, after which they retreated to the Pontic Steep. Some splinter Scythian groups nevertheless remained in Southwest Asia. One such splinter group likely joined the Medes and participated in the Median conquest of Uratu. While some of the Trans-Corsican Scythian splinter groups might have retreated northwards to join the Scythians, who had already moved into Kuban Steep previously. One group formed the kingdom in what is now Azerbaijan and Median overlordship but eventually hostilities broke out between them and Syaxeres due to which they left Transcaucasia and fled to the kingdom of Lydia as refugees. Although a section of these Scythians still remain in the southeast Caucasus, Caucasus and were later mentioned by Livy under the name of Sakasani while the country was called the land of the Sky Fioni by Xenophon, the Sacassini by Ptolemy. By the middle of the 6th century BC, the Scythians who had remained in Southwest Asia had completely assimilated culturally and politically into Median society and no longer existed as a distinct group. In the 6th century BC, the Greeks had begun establishing settlements along the coast and rivers of the Pontic Deep, coming in contact with the Scythians. Relations between the Greeks and the Scythians appear to have been peaceful, with Scythians being substantially influenced by Greeks, although the city of Panticapium might have been destroyed by the Scythians in mid-century BC. During this time, the Scythian philosopher Anacharis travelled to Athens where he made a great impression on the local people with his barbarian wisdom. So we've got the war with Persia and these depictions here are of Scythians and they've all got Phrygian caps on. So we've got Saka beyond the sea, Saka Tigraxadua and Saka Hamavagaya. So reliefs depicting Saka soldiers in the service of the Archimedean army, Xerxes I tomb, circa 480 BCE. The Archimedeans referred to all nomads to their north uh, to their north as Saka and divided them into three categories, the Saka Teai, te Paradrea, Beyond the Sea, presumably the Scythians, and Saka Tigraxadua with pointed caps, and the Saka Hamavaga, Huma drinkers, furthest east. So this is where the Phrygian cap originates from. It's from the Scythians. And it's more than likely possible that the Scythians weren't a side branch of the Greeks. They were from the, the steeped tribes. So 
the late Roman Republic in Rome, a soft felt cap called a pileus served as a symbol of free men and was symbolically given to slaves upon manumission, thereby granting them not only their personal liberty but also libertius, freedom as citizens with the right to vote if male. Following the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, Brutus and his conspirers instrumentalized the symbol of the Pileus to signify the end of Caesar's dictatorship and return to Roman Republican system. So they wore them in France. In 1675, the anti-tax and anti-nobility stamp paper revolted, erupted in Brittany and northwestern France, where it became known as the Bonnets Rouge, uprising after the blue or red caps worn by the insurgents. So the Republic of Venice in AD 1000. The Republic of Venice traditionally known as the most serene Republic of Venice, was a sovereign state and maritime republic in northeastern Italy, which existed for a millennium between the 8th century and the 18th century. It was based on the, the lagoon communities of the historically prosperous city of Venice and was a leading European economic and trading power during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So the history of the Republic of Venice traditionally begins with the foundation of the city at noon. However, the church, believed to be St. Giacomo di Rialto, dates back to no further than the 11th century. Though no surviving historical records deal directly with the fun founding of Venice, the 11th century Chronicon Altine dated the first settlement in Rivo Alto, High Shore, later Rialto, to the dedication of a church of San Giacomento on the bank of the current Grand Canal, said to have taken place at the stroke of noon on the 25th of March 421. However, studies have shown that this church dates to the mid-12th century. According to tradition, the original population consisted of refugees from nearby Roman cities such as Padua, Aquilia, Treviso, Altino and Concordia, as well as from undefend undefended countryside who were fleeing successive waves of Hun Germanic invasions. This is further supported by the documentation on the so-called apostolic families, the 12 founding families of Venice, who elected the first Doge, who in most cases traced their lineage back to Roman families. So these 12 initial founding families of Venice were um, went through to the Middle Ages and it was their ancestors that became the dogs of venice um and to be considered aristocracy in venice you had to relate back to these families the high middle ages in the high middle ages venice became wealthy through its control of trade between europe and the levant and began to expand into the adriatic sea and beyond Venice was involved in the Crusades almost from the very beginning. So there were obviously uh, agendas being played here. 200 Venetian ships assisted in capturing the coastal cities of Syria after the First Crusade and in 1123 they were granted virtual autonomy in the Kingdom of Jerusalem through the Pactum Warmundi. In 1110, or Delifo Felioro personally commanded a Venetian fleet of 100 ships to assist Baldwin I of Jerusalem in capturing the city of Sidon. In the 12th century, the Republic built a large national shipyard that was now known as the Venetian Arsenal, building new and powerful fleets. The Republic took control over the eastern Mediterranean. First exchange business in the world was started in Venezia to support merchants from all over Europe. The Venetians also gained extensive trading privileges in the Byzantine Empire and their ships often provided the empire with a navy. In 1182, there was an anti-Catholic massacre by the Orthodox Christian population of Constantinople with the Venetians as the main targets. So they were um, trading with the, the popes of Constantinople Venice was asked to provide the transportation 
for the fourth crusade, but when the crusaders could not pay the charging, the chartering, the Doge Enrico Dandolo offered a delay in the payment in exchange of their aid to recapture Zara. Today, Zara, which had rebelled against Venetian rule in 1183 and placed itself under the dual protection of the papacy and King Emmerich of Hungary. Upon accomplishing this in 1202, the crusade was again diverted to Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire called by the legitimate Emperor Alexos IV and Galos, who offered the crusades 10,000 Byzantine soldiers to help fight in the crusade, maintaining 500 knights in the Holy Land, the service of the Byzantine navy, 20 ships in transporting the crusader army to Egypt, as well as money to pay off the crusaders' debt to the Republic of Venice with 200,000 silver marks. Alexos' throne was restored, uh, the siege of Constantinople, but he refused the payment. After several accidents, Venetians and French crusaders decided to siege the city, which was captured and sacked in 1204. Venetians saved from the sack several artistic works, such as the famous four bronze horses, bringing them to Venice. The Republic of Venice signed a trade treaty with the Mongol Empire in 1221. In 1295, Pietro... So apparently the roots of the East India Company, chartered by Queen Elizabeth I on December the 31st, 1600, and dissolved in 1837, sprout from the European Black Nobility. The Black Nobility are the oligarchic families of Venice and Genoa, who in the 12th century held the privileged trading right monopolies. The first of three crusades from 1063 to 1123 established the power of the Venetian black nobility and solidified the power of the wealthy ruling class. The black nobility aristocracy achieved complete control over Venice in 1171 when the appointment of the Doge, Doge, I don't know how that's said, was transferred to what was known as the Great Council which consisted of members of commercial aristocracy. Uh, we know who they are. A complete triumph for them. Venice was rem has remained in their hands ever since. But the power and influence of the Venetian black nobility extends far beyond its borders and today is felt in every corner of the globe. In 1204, the oligarchic families parceled out feudal enclaves to their members. And from this epoch dates the great building of a power and pressure until the government became a closed corporation of the leading black nobility families. So this is the same article on a different website, it continues on. More of this can be found in the works of Dr. John Coleman, Black Nobility Unmasked Worldwide, 1985, Conspirators Hierarchy, The Story of the Committee of 300, 1992. Question, the Christopher Columbus story is a concoction how about the Marco Polo stories, anyone? Uh, the black nobility earned its title through dirty tricks. So when the population revolted against the monopolies in the government as anywhere else, the leaders of the uprising were quickly seized and brutally hanged. The black nobility, secret assassination, murder, blackmail, and the bankrupting of opposing citizens of, or companies, kidnapping, rape, and so on. The Committee of 300, A Brief History of World Power, Venetian Black Nobility, Roots of Today's Ruling Oligarchy. 300 men, all of whom know one another, direct the economic destiny of Europe and choose their successor from among themselves. Walter Rathenew, 1909, founder of the Mammoth German General Electric Corporation. Committee of 300 is a product of the British East India Company's Council of 300. East India Company was chartered by the British royal family in 1600. It made vast fortunes in the opium drug trade with China and became the largest company on earth in its time. The Committee of 300 rules the world and is the driving force behind the criminal agenda to create a new world order under a totalitarian global government. There is no need to use they 
or the enemy except as a shorthand. We know who they are. That we know who they, the enemy, is. The Committee of 300 is its aristocracy. Its ownership of the US Federal Reserve, banking system, insurance companies, giant corporations, foundations, communications networks, presides over, presided over by a hierarchy of conspirators. This is the enemy. Secret societies exist by deception. At the center of oligarchy is the idea that certain families are born to rule as an arbitrary elite, while the vast majority of any given population is condemned to oppression, serfdom or slavery. During most of the past 2,500 years, oligarchs have been identified by their support for the philosophical writings of Aristotle and their rejection of the epistemology of Plato. Aristotle asserted that slavery is a, necess a necessary institution because some are born to rule and others to be ruled. He also ruled, uh, reduced the question of human knowledge to the crudest sense certainly and perception of facts. Aristotle formalism is a means of killing human creativity and therefore represents absolute evil. This evil is expressed by the bestialist view of the oligarchs that Human beings are the same as animals. And isn't this true? You know, like they're born to rule, but we are forced to stifle our creative abilities and our potential because all we do is work and pay tax and keep these people in their lifestyle. Well, we're too tired or can't afford to live the life that we are intended to live. Oligarchs identify wealth purely in money terms and practice usury, monetism and looting at the expense of technological advancement and physical production. Oligarchs have always been associated with the arbitrary rejection of true scientific discovery and scientific method in favour of open anti-science or more subtle obscurantist pseudoscience. The oligarchy has believed for millennia that the earth is overpopulated. The oligarchical commentary of, on the Trojan War was that this conflict was necessary in order to prevent greater numbers of mankind from oppressing Mother Earth. They're constantly stressed race and racial characteristics often as a means for justifying slavery. The essence of oligarchism is summoned up in the idea of the empire in which an elite identify itself as a master race rulers over a degraded mass of slaves or other oppressed victims. If oligarchical methods are allowed to dominate human affairs, they always create a breakdown crisis of civilization with economic depression, war, famine, plague and pestilence. Examples of this are the 14th century Black Plague and the Thirty Year War in 1618-48, both of which have links to Venetian intelligence. The post-industrial society and the derivatives crisis in our own time have brought about, about the potential for a new collapse of civilization. This crisis can only be reversed by repu repudiating in practice the axioms of the oligarchical mentality. A pillar of the oligarchical system is the family fortune or fondo as it is called in Italian. The continuity of the family fortune which earns money through usury and looting as often more important than the biological continuity across generations of the family that owns the fortune. So the long and torturous path of peoples through history sees the Khazars in the Holy Land and part of the Canaanites eventually in northern Italy adopting the name Sephavian for deceptive purpose. They later become known as Ven Venetians and by marrying into European royalty and aristocracy the black nobility. In the pre-Christian world around the Mediterranean oligarchical political forces include Babylon in Mesopotamia, the whore of Babylon condemned in Apocalypse in the Apocalypse of St. John the Divine is not a mystical construction but a very specific cartel or oligarchical families. Other oligarchical centres include Hiram of Tyre and the Phoenicians. The Persian Empire was an oligarchy. In the Greek world, the centre of oligarchical banking and intelligence was the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, whose agents include Lycurgus, 
Lycurgus of Spartia and later Aristotle. In Venice, the largest fondo was the endowment of the Basilica of St. Mark, St. Mark, which was closely associated with the Venetian state treasury and which absorbed the family fortunes of nobles who died without heirs. This fondo was administered by the procurers of St. Mark, whose position was one of the most powerful under the Venetian system. Now, this here is not mentioning the Herod oligarchy as well either. So they've failed to recognize this family. Around this central fondo were grouped the individual family fortunes of the great oligarch family, such as the Mosinigo, the Cornaro, the Dandolo, the Contarini, the Morosini, uh, Morosini, that must be maybe where the Orsini family come from, the Zorzi and the Tron. When the Venetian oligarchy transferred many of its families and assets to Northern Europe, the Venetian Fondi provided the nucleus of the Great Bank of Amsterdam, which dominated Europe during the 17th century of the, and of the Bank of England, which became the leading bank of the 18th century. Venice was the enemy of Charlemagne. Charlemagne's son, King Pepin of Italy, tried unsuccessfully to conquer the Venetian lagoon. Charlemagne was to recognize Venice as a part of the Eastern or Byzantine Empire, Empire under, under the protection of Emperor Nisiphorus. Venice was never a part of the Western civilization. Over the next four centuries, Venice developed a second capital of the Byzantine Empire through marriage alliances and with certain Byzantine dynasties and conflicts of the Holy Roman Empire based in Germany. The Venetian economy grew through usury and slavery. By 1082, the Venetians had tax-free hand trading rights in the entire Byzantine Empire. The Venetians were one of the main factors behind the Crusades against the Muslim power in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the Fourth Crusade of ACE, 202, the Venetians used an army of French feudal knights to capture the loot of Constantinople, the Orthodox Christian city which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire. During the 1200s, the Venetians, now at the apex of their military and naval power, set out to create a new Roman Empire with its centre at Venice. So Venice was the enemy of Charlemagne. Charlemagne's son, King Pepin of Italy, tried unsuccessfully to conquer the Venetian lagoon. Charlemagne was forced to recognise Venice as a part of the Eastern Byzantine Empire under the protection of Emperor Nisiphorus. Venice was never a part of the Western civilization. Over the next four centuries, Venice developed as a second capital of the Byzantine Empire through marriage alliances with certain Byzantine dynasties and conflicts with the Holy Roman Empire based in Germany. The Venetian economy grew through usury and slavery. By 1082, the Venetians had tax-free trading rights in the entire Byzantine Empire. The Venetians were one of the main factors behind the Crusades against the Muslim power in the Eastern Mediterranean. In the Fourth Crusade of ACE 1202, the Venetians used an army of French feudal knights to capture and loot Constantinople, the Orthodox Christian city, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire. And I wonder why they wanted the crusade so much not only to make money from war but also to take back jerusalem as their trading capital during the 1200s the venetians now at the apex of the military and naval power set out to create a new roman empire with its center at venice they expanded into the greek islands the black sea the italian mainland they helped to defeat the hohenstufen rulers of germany and italy Venetian intelligence assisted Genghis Khan as he attacked and wiped out powers that had resistance had resisted Venice. And if we remember, uh, Venice had formed an alliance with the Mongol Empire. The Venetians caused the death of the poet and political figure Dante Alighieri, who developed the concept of the modern sovereign nation state in opposition of the Venetian plans for empire. A series of wars with Genoa led later to the de facto merger of Venice and Genoa. The Venetian bankers, often called Lombards, began to loot many parts of Europe with usurious, with usurious loans. Henry III of England, in the years after 1255, became insolvent after taking a huge Lombard loan to finance foreign wars at 
120 to 180% interest. This transaction created the basis for the Venetian party in England when the Lombard bankers went bankrupt because the English failed to pay. A breakdown crisis of the European economy ensued. This led to a new collapse of European civilization, including the onset of the Black Plague, which de depopulated the continent. In the midst of the chaos, the Venetians encouraged their ally Edward III of England to wage war against France in the conflict that became the Hundred Years War of 1339 and 1453, which hurled France into chaos before St. Joan of Arc defeated the English. This was then followed by the War of the Roses in England as a result of Venetian domination. 14th century had become a catastrophe for civilization. In the midst of the crisis of the 1300s, the friends of Dante and Petrarch laid the basis for the Italian Golden Renaissance, which reached its uh, culmination with Nicholas of Cusa, Pope Pius II, and the Medici sponsored Council of Florence in 1439. The Venetians fought the Renaissance with the policy of expansion on the Italian mainland. So this is another article about the Venetian black nobility. These people earned the title of black nobility from their ruthless lack of scruple. They employed murder, rape, kidnapping, assassination, robbery, and all manner of deceit in the grand scale, brooking no opposition or attaining their objectives. These all have immense wealth and money is power. The most powerful of the black nobility families are located in Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Britain, Holland, and Greece in the order. Their roots may be traced back to the Venetian oligarchs who are of the Casa extraction and married into these royal houses in the early parts of the 12th century. Um, it was a lot earlier than that. Following a great Casa victory over the Arabs, the future Emperor Constantine V married a Casa princess and their son became Emperor Leo IV, also known as Leo the Casa. The Medici popes, Pius XII, Eugenio Pacalli, and John Paul II were Khazars. Not all the black nobility are royal houses, and many of their royal families no longer have kingdoms. According to researchers and author Dr. John Coleman, a committee of 300 was established early in the 18th century, although it did not take on its present form until around 1897 when the China opium trade was legalized. Documentary proof as to the existence of the Committee of 300 is not forthcoming and it may be no more than a convenient phrase to describe certain key players, socialist, politician and financial advisor to the Rothschilds, Walter Rathenu, writing in the Wiener Press 24 December 1921, said only 300 men, each of whom knows all the others, govern the fate of Europe. They select their successors from the from their entourage. These men have the means in their hands of putting an end to the form of state which they find unreasonable. Exactly six months after publication, Rathenu was assassinated. Dr. Coleman's work opens the door to further studies on named members of the ruling elite, particularly in America, where the English have a long history and are very aware of their ancestry. Certain families of blue bloods in the United States have their historic ties with the British thoroughblood and money. These noble families are behind most of, if not all of the so-called pro-environmental movements that are actually intended to curb the population growth of all nations. Prince Philip and Prince Charles are the most visible symbols of this movement and are a true part of the conspiracy to destroy industry and to take world back to a new dark age. Most, if not all, the crowned and uncrowned heads of these dynasties enjoy huge incomes from ground rents. All favour Global 2000 reports to the president that's calculated to end all industrial progress and by famine, disease and wars eliminate the excess population industry supports. The key to economic development and prosperity in the third world, they ardently desire to return to the feudal system where they will once again be absolute rulers. While professing Christianity, the oligarchical families for the greater part actually despise it in secret. Masonry provides their religious fulfillment and without faith they have no belief in reward or punishment and a world to come. They live for their here and now. And now um, it's interesting because I want to go into this as far as the ten horns on the beast of the sea, how they hate the woman. 
and the woman being the church and they they burn her you know they sort of have this relationship with the woman through controlling the people and the banking dragon and yet it's their desire to hate her and burn her many of these oligarchies are in the drug and arms trade though well distanced intermediaries like so many of the large banks prince bernhardt is the leader of the black families and he also claims descent from the house of david through the merovingian dynasty a claim that was acknowledged to be valid by the carolingian dynasty that supplanted them by other monarchs and by the roman church of that time thus he can truly say that he is related to jesus now i think this is a truism this this um so-called descent to the house of david and i believe this is through the herod line through the hasmonean kings that herod married into um and this comes down through the carax pergamum line through to these uh carolingian and merovingian dynasties also i can't find any proof of the herods moving to Lyon in france there is that proof that in the fall of jerusalem that um that a lot of jews moved to Lyon, um and so herod antipas was banished there and his wife herodians daughter salome had three sons it's possible that other herods moved to this city and i can show which i will show in my next video the lineage of these um this pergamon line that uh gets brought into the church in Lyon. so this is where i think they are making this claim from and this supports my belief that the herod family and the red dragon and let's just have a look at this heraldry we have a red dragon I don't know it looks a bit like a lion but it could be a it could be a lion or a dragon but we've got one two three four five six seven points on the dragon so um i think they know who they are but they're claiming the descent from the house of david because it sounds more important and more righteous like they are chosen by god to rule so it says prince bernhard's house of orange has its origin in france so this ties in with possibly coming from Herod Antipas, but I can prove it definitely comes from the Herod Carax of Pergamon line, um, who are said to have descended from the tribe of Benjamin who went into exile following war, which with the other 11 tribes. It says here they are aligned with the Arcadian royal line towards the advent of the Christian era migrated up the Danube and Rhine through marriage, engendering the Sicambrian Franks, the immediate forebearers of the Merovingians who were ultimately of Semitic origin and descendants of King Saul. They are identified with the Spartans and both books of the Maccabees link the Spartans with the Jews. 1 Maccabees 12 tells of Jonathan sending a letter to the loud Dominians, Spartan Greeks, asking for their help since they were brethren. The Spartans replied, it is found in writing that loud Dominians and Jews are brethren and they are of the stock of Abraham. It is assumed by some writers that this means the Spartans were Israelites, but the Spartans were not Israelites, were Edomites descended from Bela, son of Boa, and brother of Balaam and king of Edom. Edom was the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham who sold his birthright and bred his prosperity off the book of life. Early in the 15th century the Merovingians established themselves in what is now Belgium and northern France. There they adopted the Kabbalistic pseudo-Christianity of the Cathars, a dualistic religion that holds there are two eternal gods, the god of good and the god of evil. It is revealing that this Luciferian belief is held by Masons of high degree and those who would be masters of this world today and who claim that Lucifer will ultimately be victorious. Now, um, this I bring this up in my first video that there's no real 
discussion of this Lucifer story in the Old Testament. We have the serpent in the garden and the other um, scriptures relating to the dragon are referring to the Pharaoh of Egypt and the king of Assyria and the king of Tyre. And that's why I started to research this red dragon being the king of Judea as the Herod because it tells the story of King Herod trying to um, destroy the children or the baby coming from the woman and that's exactly what he did. Under Clovis I who reigned from 481 to 511 the Franks converted to Roman Catholicism. Through him Rome began to establish undisputed supremacy in Western Europe in return for being the sword of Rome whereby the church would manifest her power and impose a spiritual dominion clovis was granted the title of new constantine and to preside over an un, uh, over a unified holy roman empire based on the church and administered on the secular level in perpetuity by the merovingian bloodline like the sure mercies of david this was a pact that could be modified but not revoked broken or betrayed in 496 the church pledged itself in perpetuity to the Merovingian bloodline it was presumably in full knowledge of their claimed identity this would explain why Clovis was offered the status of royal Roman emperor and why he was not created but only crowned king in 754 the church clandestinely betrayed its pact so history of the black nobility in Carthage and Canaanites called themselves Punics Rome attacked Carthage in full force beginning in 264 BC and completed their task after killing and or enslaving every Carthaginian by sowing the land with salt so that nothing could ever grow there again. The Edomites descended from Esau, later intermarried with the Turks to produce a Turco-Edomite mixture which later became known as Khazars, who are present occupants of Israel. These Canaanites eventually adopted the name Safavium for deceptive purposes they later became known as Venetians and by marrying into European royalty and aristocracy the black nobility. Um, the Venetians today controlled the Federal Reserve System in the US around AD 1400. European power centers coalesced into two camps. The Ghibellines who supported the Empress, Hohenstaufen family and the Guelphs or the well or the Welfs, the Welfs, the German prince who completed, uh, who competed with Frederick for control of the Holy Roman Empire. The Pope allied himself with the Guelphs. All modern history seems directly from the struggle between these two powers. The Guelphs are also called the Neri Black Guelphs or Black Nobility and supported William of Orange in his seizure of the throne of England, which eventually resulted in the formation of the Bank of England and the East India Company, which would rule the world from the 17th century all coup d'etats revolutions and wars in the 19th and 20th centuries are centered in the battle of the guelphs to hold and enhance their power which is now the new world order now um there's the dutch east indies company uh remember i was talking about the um ashkenazim went to holland and the dutch east indies uh, company was very powerful and they were big slave traders and it was this English East India company that rivaled them and took over their power when Oliver Cromwell opened up England to the Jews again in the 1600s. The power of the Guelphs would extend through the Italian financial centre to the north of France in Lombardy. All Italian bankers are referred to as the Lombards. Lombard in German means deposit bank. And the Lombards are bankers to the entire medieval world. They would later transfer operations north to Hamburg, then to Amsterdam, and finally to London. Now, this is so close to the region of the Radonites, uh, the Lugdunium or Lyon, and to where the Jews came at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD and where the Herods were, Herod Antipas. And I can't help but see the connections here. The, the merchants in the bank, uh, the merchants in the temple, the merchants on the Silk Road, now the merchants of Venice. 
so it says they would later transfer operations to north north to hamburg then to amsterdam so holland amsterdam when they all moved away from spain and finally to london so from amsterdam oliver cromwell let them back into london the Guelphs would start the slave trade to the colonies. The Guelphs, in order to aid their control of finance and politics, would perpetuate Gnostic cults, which eventually developed into the Rosicrucians, Unitarians, Fabian Society, and the World Council of Churches. The East India Company, together with John Stuart Mill, would finance the University of London. So every institution that we know about today that makes you pass through gates is ruled by these people. A friend of Mill historian George Grote, a founder of the London University, donated £6,000 for the study of mental health, which began the worldwide mental health movement. Of course it did. Banks large and small in their thousands are in the Committee of 300 Network. Of special interest is Bank Del Al Sviseria Italiana, since it handles flight capital investments and to the form of United States, primarily in dollars and US bonds. Located and isolated in Mutual Luguano, the flight capital center for the Venetian black nobility. Luguano is not in Italy or in Switzerland and it is kind of twilight zone for shady flight capital operations. George Ball, who owns a large block of stock in BSI, is a prominent insider and bank US representative. In the secret 1822 Treaty of Verona between Austria, France, Prussia and Russia, the Jesuits agreed to smash the US Constitution and suppress it, the freedom of the US. Their methods included destroying free speech, destroying and suppressing the press, universal censorship, sustaining the cooperation of the Pope and clergy to use religion to help keep nations in passive obedience and financing wars against countries with representative governments. The monarchs who signed this treaty were ultimately dis deposed. Most of these families are very wealthy and may be more powerful today than when they sat upon thrones. They are known collectively as the black nobility. Privately, these families refuse to recognize any right to rule except them their own. And I'd say this about the British royal family. Everyone says to get rid of them, but to get rid of them just makes their life easy, to be honest, because they're so wealthy that they just go undercover, they can do whatever they want with all their money and they won't have to do these obligatory ceremonies and the stupid stuff that they hate, like Prince Harry, for example, and Meghan, they just, you know, don't tell me they have to earn their own money. The fact that uh, this treaty was made long ago does not mean it is void. The treaty was placed in the congressional record on 25th, April 25th, 1916 by Senator Owen. In 1948, George H.W. Bush granted, graduated from Val Yale University and the Skull and Bones. He is a distant cousin of the Queen of England, part of the black nobility which traces its power back 5,000 years. Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands created a group that became known as the Bilderbergers. And it just goes on. Um, uh, since the Bilderbergers, according to former British intelligence agent John Coleman, serves as a binding force between the three major one world government forces, the Wicca Masons, communism, the black nobility, descendants of the early Roman emperors and Maltese Jesuits, each of which have 13 respective representatives on the 39 members Bilderberg board. According to the former British intelligence agent Dr. John Coleman, the three world power groups, the Wicca Masons of Communism, the Maltese Jesuits and the Black Nobility, uh, Black in this context refers to their character, not their skin colour, all work for un and all work for and under the central command of the Bavarian Illuminati, which binds them together. The old line ruling families believe that they have the right to rule the world because they are descended from the emperors and the ancient Roman Empire and the and or the emperors of the so-called Holy Roman Empire descended from the Merovingian dynasty consistent with 13 to 15 blue blood families. Now it actually goes back further than that because these ancient houses like the um, Egyptians, the Assyrians, the um, Persians, 
uh, the Greeks, they all believed that their divine right to rule was the fact that they were given this right by God, that somehow they were demigods and that they were the only people who could rule on earth. And when you talk about that, we talk about, um, you know, like uh, the Mary Queen of Scots, um, you know, that whole time period where the Scottish were trying to rule, they believed it was their divine right to rule. And I believe King James from the King James Bible believed it his, was his divine right by God, by superior genetics to rule. Prominent on the board of two insurance giants are committee of 300 members, the Gustarini, the Gustianani family, black nobility of Rome and Venice, who trace their lineage to the Emperor Justinian. Sir Jocelyn Hambro of the Hambros, Pierre Paolo Luzzati Fequis, whose lineage dates back to 6th century to the most ancient Luzzatus, the black nobility, nobility of Venice, Umberto Ortoliani, Ortolani of the ancient black nobility family of the same name. Other of Venetian Black Nobility Committee of 300 members and board members of the ASG and ARSA are the Doria family, the finances of the Spanish Habsburgs, L. de Rothschild of the French Rothschild family, Baron August von Fink, Franco Orsini, bon Bonacassi of the ancient Orsini Black Nobility that traces their lineage to an ancient Roman senator of the same name. Um, the Alba family, whose lineage dates back to the great Duke of Alba, Baron Pierre Lambert, a cousin of the Belgian Rothschild family. So I could go on and on and on about this, but my motive here is to trace their roots and to show who they are biblically and how they've moved and used these systems of church, state, banking and military to control us, the people. In my next video, I'm going to go into the family lineage showing how the Herod family moved into the Roman and Parthian royal houses and they became these families that took over Europe and eventually the dragon gets chained but it resurges again in the little season and I believe that little season is now and I believe that was the fact that these people gained back control of Jerusalem in 1967. I uh, hope you enjoyed this information and, and I'll see you in the next video.